Hello, and welcome to Research Chatter, a podcast sponsored by the Strategic Management Society. I'm your co-host, Ronnie Chatterjee from Duke University in North Carolina, and I'm joined by Charlie Williams from Bocconi University in Milan. Hi, Ronnie. Great to be here with you again. It has been far too long since we recorded our last episode. We apologize to our listeners. We fell far short of our goal of monthly episodes on strategy research. But we've been looking at your feedback. We've been thinking about how to move forward with the show. And we're back. We missed you, faithful listeners. Charlie, this is why you're in strategy and not in marketing. We should frame our hiatus in a much more positive light. You know, I was going to talk about it like it was a sabbatical that we had sort of earned. Or maybe it was like a season two after one of these very short season one for all my favorite oh, no. shows. I, I'm not sure we're doing ourselves any favors with a sabbatical uh, sabbatical talk. But. Charlie, all the great shows just have like seven episodes at a time and then they come back for a triumphant second season. But look, no this matter what true. you call it, I'm glad to be back. Uh, we have used our time off, as you've said, to kind of reload, think about our next few episodes pretty strategically, gotten a lot of feedback for what the content might be, and uh, we think that you, our audience, is, is going to love it. Uh, this is our sixth episode of Research Chatter. The purpose of the series has been and will always continue to be to highlight big ideas from business school professors from around the world. In each episode, we're going to focus on one topic where B-School researchers are uncovering new insights and try to translate the findings into ideas that you can take to work in the real world or discuss with your students if you teach this stuff like we do. This podcast is an experiment, one that Charlie and I have already learned a lot from. It's an experiment to try to speed up the translation process from academic ideas to action. And we've received some great feedback from business people over the last five episodes, which we also truly appreciate. So keep them coming. And we've also heard from lots of you who are using it to introduce research areas to your PhD students. So however you use research chatter, please continue to send us your feedback and suggestions. So Charlie, with all the political earthquakes going on in the U.S. and in Europe, seems like it's a good time to talk about what drives economic growth and you yes. know what strategy scholars have to say about it. Because at the heart of a lot of these debates um, across the pond here in the U.S. is the dissatisfaction, I think, with the pace of economic growth and the distribution of its gains. And strategy scholars, although it might seem unusual to some, actually have a lot to say on this particular topic. Because a lot of our work is in high-tech industries, innovation clusters, entrepreneurship, accelerators. It feeds right into the playbook that policymakers are trying to use to spur growth. And of course, if you have more high-tech businesses, well, that's got to equal better, right, for economic growth. But one thing to throw in there is, you know, Elizabeth Warren, our senator here from Massachusetts in the United States Senate, she reminded us last week when she spoke out about some very important issues in technology. She came out swinging and uh, was talking about big American tech firms like Google, Apple, and Amazon, who are using their size to actually snuff out competition. So, Charlie, with all the focus on encouraging high-growth businesses, but this emerging critique that maybe our high-growth, our high-tech businesses are too powerful, well, what's going on here? How do we make sense of it? Well, yeah, Ronnie, it was it was big news in the U.S. for uh, for such a high-profile senator to be talking about that. And, of course, that's an old theme or a regular theme here in Europe. Europe has been much more aggressive with tech firms about going after them for competition policy. There's been been sort of three areas that Europe has has targeted big tech firms. And it may be because they could, we kind of lack some of the tech power here that, that uh, the government's more willing to take them on. But around issues of, of competition, whether firms like Google are using their power in one market to expand into other markets, whether they are favorite, Google in particular is favoring its own search or its own products and some of its results, but also on issues like taxes, whether they're paying taxes in the places they're doing business. Uh, and finally, really interestingly, around issues of privacy. While the U.S. has been very open on data sharing and, and what data you give up to companies when you use their product, Europe has been, been hewing a far more strict line about in how individuals should be able to control their data. So, Charlie, the topic of today's podcast uh, is the work of a great man, Stephen Klepper, in a new book called Experimental Capitalism. Professor Klepper sadly passed away in 2013, but with the help of some of his colleagues, this book was published uh, after his passing. And we're lucky to kind of see how Professor Klepper explained uh, his theories about how industries evolve, uh, where new firms come from, where shakeouts occur and why, and finally, how industries evolve over time into either stable orders where a set of small firms dominate uh, or or maintain a multitude of, of, of producers uh, with, with a more competitive environment. And it's those insights, I think, are really important for policymakers uh, around the world as they think about how to spur high-growth entrepreneurship and innovation uh, and new high-tech clusters. 
So true. So true. And it, it's, it's lovely how this book really crosses levels from these very high level important ideas, but he builds from such detailed studies of many, many different industries. So he likes to call what he does nano economics for the, the incredibly fine grained detail he has. But this builds from many published journal articles on the auto industry, the tire industry, the television industry, semiconductors and lasers. So many of those studies were published in our own SMS's strategic management journal as well as other top management and economics journals around the field, he loomed, loomed really large in the fields of economics, entrepreneurship, and techno technology, both intellectually, as we'll see today, but also physically. He was a big guy with a booming, deep voice. Tragically, he passed away in 2013, but this year the book is coming out, supported, the, the very final pieces were still just in notes form, and his colleagues at Carnegie Mellon, John Miller, David Hounschel and Sergei Boraguinsky, they finished up the book. And so the final chapter is actually some of his writing and then tidied up notes from them and from a writing consultant who all, who all dealt with this. But anyway, in this era of slow economic growth and underwhelming productivity gains, his lessons from high-tech successes uh, seem particularly relevant. So Ronnie, what did you make of the book? Well, you know, I first think when you look at the industries he studied, you know, it's the auto industry, uh, it's the tire industry, television, semiconductors, lasers. This book, Experimental Capitalism, is really focused around his research on these six uh, high-tech industries. And he uses that to sort of synthesize some ideas to guide our understanding today of how high-tech industries emerge, uh, how they shake out and evolve, uh, and eventually crash in the cases of the auto and the tire industry. So I thought that despite the six industries being ones that I had varying interest in, some more interesting than others, I, I found a lot that resonated with the way I think about uh, high-tech industries today. You know, as you know, Charlie, and, and many listeners probably know, I, I owe a lot to uh, Stephen Klepper. Uh, my dissertation on spawning in the medical device industry was, you know, inspired by his work and the work of a few others who were writing uh, at that time. I know, uh, he, I know Klepper even cites a, a paper from your dissertation in the well, book. And, well, uh, and mentions I mean, it. It, was a, it was a great honor when he first, during a graduate seminar that I saw uh, as a student at Berkeley, actually mentioned my work. It was the first time that a senior scholar uh, had ever mentioned my work in a seminar. And uh, it was thrilling, as, as people I know, imagine, when that happens for the first imagine. time, especially with someone you really respect. And and, and Stephen, as everyone will tell you, is, is not just a, a giant scholar, but but a, but a great man and sort of a great combination. And we lost him in 2013 way too early. And as you know from the book, uh, his colleagues, devoted colleagues at uh, Carnegie Mellon, um, actually helped finish the book. So the last part of the book is actually an outline uh, which Stephen Klepper ha had left behind. And so when you look at the book, I think uh, what's interesting and exciting to me is that the spinoffs that I studied in my dissertation, I hadn't always thought about it in the broader context of industrial organization and, and economics. And I thought the phenomenon of spinoffs was just really interesting to study. But what Klepper does is he puts it at the center, at the center of how industries evolve and shake out, because of course, spinoffs are an important part of that story, and how economic activity agglomerates and clusters. And so when you connect this, this really interesting feature, spinoffs, which I, I'm very passionate about, to these huge trends in industrial economics. I sort of feel like he uh, um, sort of unveils a world and the connections of these smaller ideas to the big picture in a way I hadn't seen before. So for folks who want to sort of situate their own uh, research, let's say, in innovation and industrial economics into the broader theme, Klepper's book did that for me. And I, that was sort of one of my big takeaways in terms of, in terms of the book. For me, for me also, because I tend to think of it as this sort of individual area of entrepreneurship. What are the sorts of seeds and companies that make them really successful? But to see that it was this driving mechanism in his theory for how and when industries evolve, I, I was both... Uh, surprised and, and really interested in that. So um, I, I thought that was uh, that was really, yeah. really cool to see as well. I, I did want to just, we should be clear, this phenomenon or this theory goes by many, many different names, and that yeah. can be a little confusing. So uh, Klepper really, I think, got this going with his talk of spinoffs. Some people have not loved that term because it sounds a lot like corporate carve-outs or spinoffs where there's some shared ownership. What he's really talking about are new firms founded by individuals who used to work at the big dominant firms in this industry. It's also been called spin outs. In your work, you called it spawns. And now there's a thriving area called employee entrepreneurship within entrepreneurship. But all these really are about this same thing. 
firms that are founded by people with extensive experience in some of the industry leaders in an industry. That's right. And that's why when my students ask me, you know, how should I start a career in entrepreneurship? Uh, and, and Klepper actually touched on this in his chapter eight outline um, about advice to give to someone in that case. I often point to these descriptive facts about how many entrepreneurs actually have extensive experience in the industry. Because sometimes I think we might anchor too closely on uh, people like Zuckerberg and Gates who seem to drop out of school and didn't have as much industry experience. But we forget that you know a lot of the other entrepreneurs in these other industries had significant industry experience, but again, so it true. depends. It depends on the industry. We also focus on the twenty somethings going through the accelerators, and yet this theory suggests it's the experienced leaders high up in these firms when they go and found a new firm in the industry. These are the ones that really impact the sort of uh, evolution and, and progress of the industry. And, and that's why, Charlie, I don't know if you were thinking about this as you read the book, and maybe people who teach strategy, uh, I think, will find this useful. I really thought about using this book in class, and, and I thought about selling my students on the following idea. You know, I don't know if you can always make a bunch of prescriptions from from this kind of work or any of the work that that we're doing on this topic. It, it's hard to say. You know, this is the cases when spinoffs are going to occur, so watch out for that and do something to keep your employees in house. I, it's a very complicated set uh, of ideas, but descriptively understanding the way these industries emerge. So you can understand whether your industry looks like lasers or semiconductors or the penicillin industry. It's really interesting. And also, I think it challenges a lot of the rules that I think our students and, and us, I think, use as rules of thumb to understand industries. You know, there wasn't always a shakeout in every industry that he studied, for example. So lasers didn't have the kind of characteristic shakeout uh, that auto and tires and some of the other ones did. And I, I love bringing those examples into class, which basically say, look, the conventional wisdom that you think you have about sort of the way industries evolve doesn't apply in all cases. And so you might be in one of those cases. Uh, and it's important to understand there are exceptions. So that, that was another thing well, I thought was cool. You are following in the footsteps of, uh, of Klepper again with that one, aren't you? He loved to take on the received <laughs> wisdom. And he, he did that um, in several ways, of course, in this book. But, but in particular with the spinoffs, one of the things he took on with that was he critiqued the research on location of industry. So there was a big, there is a big focus for really over a hundred years, dating way back in economics, the fact that very dominant industries seem to emerge in in tight locations. You know, yeah. just what we think of films in L.A. and cars in Detroit and. Um, I want to use a non-American example, yeah. but I'm uh, I'm stumbling. Well, what about at the, the footwear in Italy? Do I have to have? Footwear do I have to give you that one? Pharmaceuticals <laughs> in Switzerland, in <laughs> right. France. The but but uh, the dominant theory for that really probably comes from Marshall in economics, and then Michael Porter in strategy, who talked a lot about how these clusters have lots to share. There's knowledge flowing between them, and the the employees are flowing between them, and the suppliers and the leading customers are all gathered there. Well, and and so the idea is you're in. In that you're doing well because you're in that tight location and you can benefit from all the knowledge that's there. Well, Clusters, Klepper's story is basically, no, when these spinoffs happen, the employees leave one, one company in that industry and then they start another company. Well, of course, they start at where they already are. They know everyone there. Their home is there. Their family is there. And he can point to industries that agglomerated. And for instance, the, the hard drive industry we talked about with disruption, that one started actually in multiple locations. But most of the spinoffs from IBM's own hard drive uh, division dominated. And that was based in Silicon Valley. So that eventually that ended up very agglomerated. But some of the other examples you mentioned say laser one of his others I forget they 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 didn't have as many spin-offs and so they didn't end up agglomerating right. and uh, so he has this much simpler story for it, for why right rather it. than a story about com, um, you know complicated agglomeration economies it's a story about mortgages and your kids in school and your spouse working <laughs> in the same town <laughs> and you're not wanting to move and you know well, Miles Mile Schaefer in Minnesota as many listeners will know is working on a great book around Minnesota uh, and some of the reasons that sort of managers stay in that area and circulate and I think mm. that Klepper is saying something similar here which is that, look, a lot of these areas that we know as clusters did not have natural advantages that would predispose them to hosting those industries. And again, the spinoffs, the people who study spinoffs, spawns, employee entrepreneurship, this is taking our work and sort of plugging it into a whole nother literature, a large literature on sort of concentrations of economic activity and saying, wow, spinoffs are the key to unlock some insights about that too. And that, that was yeah. amazing to me to think yeah. about our research in, in that way. And he's saying, look, the spinoffs were a big part of that story, um, which, which is interesting too, Charles because I think it also portends with a lot of our tech companies today, which I think we'll get yes. to in a little bit, because they're also heavily concentrated. 
Yes. So I do, I do want to touch on the, well, actually, let, let, let me just hop into the tech, tech companies today because I had this, I was reading this, I was just thinking, so they're very concentrated, but are they spinning off? And I have to admit my, my own first gut instinct was no, you know, cause, cause one of the things Klepper says is it's real often the second generation of firms, those that came from like in semiconductors, those that came from Fairchild were Intel and Motorola and, uh-huh. and uh, AMD and National, right? The those spinoffs are the ones that really formed this industry. And I kept thinking, so well, who are the the second generation who would form at the the basis of our digital digital industries after Facebook, Google, Apple? But actually, I have to admit, I did a little googling around, nothing to the extent of data analysis, but just looking for you know top firms founded by Apple employees. And actually, I found that there's plenty of big name firms that are in fact spinoffs. So Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest. All count former Googlers among their founders. LinkedIn, Android, and of course Pixar. All were launched by former Apple employees, and in fact, the Apple founder. So, mm-hmm. I guess, what's your impression of spinoffs? Well, do you think they're they're in a sense? Charlie, ingredient? again, a, a great book will do this for you. It makes you think about the things you think you know. Uh, and the things you want to find out differently. And so I think a lot of us now are rushing into the spinoff literature, or have been for the last five years, myself included, trying to catalog you know, former employees of incumbent firms like Apple, uh, like Google, and seeing what they do. You know, There's this famous PayPal mafia, which is another example of, of a lot of spinoffs from PayPal. Mm. But here's the thing that's interesting. You know, what, what employee entrepreneurship is capturing is – Anybody, you know, who worked at a company at a certain level, you know, or maybe not uh, all levels, if it's a small company, leaves and starts a company. But the dynamics that Klepper's studying actually port- are kind of hinged on different things. And what I mean is, in some cases, he's looking at former employees at the top who left and competed directly in the core business, in some cases, in, in the autos with their former employer. In lasers, he looks at sub-markets, right, where these employees are actually maybe going to enter in niches and not necessarily compete directly with the incumbent firm. And so what I see in Silicon Valley among a lot of firms, and, and again, I haven't done the data analysis here too, but I think an interesting empirical question, you know, people are leaving these companies and, and, and starting really cool products, uh, really cool companies that produce products in all parts of tech, but they're not necessarily making a search engine to compete with Google or a new operating system to compete with Microsoft. And so maybe one of the reasons you're not seen um, the, the sort of cycles that, that Klepper has documented is that you're seeing a lot more innovation in some markets and niches. And he mentions, by the way, that segmentation in some markets are really a key barrier um, to a lot of the change that he's uh, observed in some of the industries that have been more fluid. So I, I think you have lots of Googlers and people from Microsoft and people from you know the next generation, Facebook and Twitter, starting companies. I'm not sure that they're necessarily competing in the same space. I just think there's so many markets with so much money, uh, in particular in tech, uh, that you're not going to see the same dynamics that you'd see, let's say, in the auto industry. That, that was just my yes. initial opinion. I'd, I'd be interested so to maybe, what you think Maybe about this it. digital world looks much more like his laser industry with lots of sub- segments, lots of room for the, for new players to to come and evolve, but it also means you don't have the turnover of these uh, these old companies. I think, I think about it, Charlie. I think you know a huge issue is like barriers to entry, complementary assets, some of the fundamental things we study in strategy and in, in I.O. I mean, if I'm going to leave a pharmaceutical company as a scientist at Merck and start a new pharma company uh, or a new biotech company... The complementary assets I need to start that company seem to be pretty significant. But starting up a company, leaving Facebook, um, and starting a new, let's say, mobile app, um, even in social networking, I think I think the barriers to entry are lower, and the complementary assets required are are less. Um, and you know, it might not be the same in all cases uh, of tech, but I think there's differences across industries that are also going to uh, kind of exacerbate these spinoff patterns, and that might be what we're seeing. Yeah, yeah, could be. Okay, we've we uh, there's so much more in this book on this topic uh, on spinoffs and submarkets. Do take a look. But we started this podcast off talking about the role of government policy, and that is the other big theme of the book. He really touches a lot on uh, what was the role of government in development of these these high tech industries he studied. So, so what did you think about about what he had to say about the emergence of uh, government and the emergence of these industries? Sure. Well, this has been a topic that's been interesting to academics and also policymakers for a long time. Uh, Professor Josh Lerner at Harvard Business School has a great book on uh, venture capital and, and government support called Boulevard of Broken Dreams. And I think economists have generally been sort of very um, sort of 
you know, sort of reticent about the, or reluctant, I'm saying, to support uh, direct government intervention, the picking winners that was often characterizing, let's say, Japan uh, in the 1980s, or at least the sto- as the story goes. But I think what is more favorable, at least from the economics point of view, is to lay the foundation with solid education and infrastructure and, and good institutions, and then letting the companies spur up from there. And, and Klepper talks about that in his book. But Klepper also notes, which is very interesting, in the emergence of some of these industries, particularly those around World War II, is the heavy hand of government coming into many of these industries, mostly through subsidizing R&D, often for military applications. So I think he paints a pretty nuanced picture of government's involvement and sort of you know, prescribes maybe government getting uh, having a stronger case for intervention early on in industries, uh, but le- less so later on. Um, although when you see some of these entrenched oligopolies that emerge in these industries, sometimes you wonder the limits um, of that as well. But I see him sort of painting a more nuanced picture of when and where government should get involved that's really tied to industry evolution, not surprisingly given his uh, his work. Yeah. Yep. And, and really many of our interests. Yeah. So there was, I, I, I really appreciated the, the nuance and the level of difference as well. There was the early versus late where the early, it seemed, seemed true. The government played an important role, but again, it was more mostly not entirely, but mostly an enabling role. So the science where say pharmaceuticals came from, where the, many of these were the, um, uh, industry semiconductors, where these came from, was often government sponsored. And then the government played an important role as a consumer, as really the lead customer and the largest customer for some time. Later on, he makes an interesting case that actually competition policy might hurt you. So his whole model, and again, this is his model, but is that size is key for creating incentives for continuing innovation. So once one of these companies really gets out in front, if they're actually really large and dominant, they will have more incentive to innovate. And so there'll be this flywheel of continuing innovation, commercialization. And so he argues that in this sort of middle period, having one company really stand out as a dominant firm actually may maximize innovation rather than having a couple smaller competitors going at going against each other. Yeah, I mean, and this is sort of one uh, sort of, uh, you know, view of industry evolution. He cites the others, like, you know, sort of work on dominant design, for example, or, or other technological explanations for, for uh, industry evolution. I think what's really interesting, though, now having worked in government is that, you know, this sort of, propo- mm. uh, pre- you know, sort of proposals for a more nuanced or more sort of nimble government regulator uh, in particular, they're very hard to execute in practice. So, you know, once you, sure you, once you set up a regulator that is supposed to maybe only intervene or only subsidize R&D early in the industry's evolution, you end up with people lobbying to change the definition of what it means to be early, right? Just like when you set up support programs for small businesses or craft breweries or whatever you want, the definition of what is small and what is craft will, will change on you. And once you set the government bureaucracy up, uh, it's very difficult to limit its uh, ability to intervene in particular cases. And I think that creates a lot of issues. So I think while it might be ideal for government to intervene in the early stages of industries, for example, especially ones with, with, with public spill overs and then kind of back off later, as Kleppers might be sort of saying here later in the book, I think it's hard to execute. And I think this is where, um, you know, there is a huge gap between how academics think about the relationship between business and public policy and what can actually be executed uh, in practice. Um, and I think I've seen that firsthand in government. So it's I think the ideas are very useful. This is the part of the book where translating into practice is probably harder for me uh, than I would if I, let's say, brought into my MBA classroom, where that section of the book, I think, really speaks to our aspiring managers. Isn't that interesting? Because I would say, in some ways, his ambitions are greatest here, rather than actually speaking to entrepreneurs, and yet... It's very hard to imagine effective regulators navigating these these many opposing and different, really opposite roles they should play. And I'm I'm no free market purist, but but it is you can see how bureaucracies get their own logic, they get moving, and it would be very hard to then reel them back in and say no. Right now, it's just the perfect time for a monopolist to just dominate sure. and uh, maximize innovation. Yeah. It's 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 a hard sell once you put this whole competition uh, bureaucracy in place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think Charlie in the end. My assessment is that the book is very provocative in terms of both how I think about the evolution of industries and government's role. But I think the evolution of industries part is something that I'm just committed to bringing into the classroom because I think that for our students, even if there are not clear prescriptions of what to do, understanding the different patterns, the role of spinoffs, but also that you know in these six industries, there's a lot of heterogeneity. I think that's interesting. And having my students do the thought experiment to think about which one of those industries they might be in or which one they might want to start uh, as entrepreneurs could be really cool. The 
government part, I think I take uh, I take in, in 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 sort of it's a it's a good idea. It's interesting in execution. I have to think more about how I would actually sort of implement uh, Professor Klepper's ideas if I was a government official again. So that I, you know, I think true. it's useful, but uh, but I need to work a little bit hard before I can operationalize it. How about yeah. you? What, what was yeah. your assessment like overall on the book? Same for me. I mean, first of all, I just I I really appreciated this both um, careful, rich, but and detailed, but also ambitious statement from from one of our top scholars. So it was just such a pleasure to read. There were for me, it really highlights. You know, we we've learned so much, but of course, there's always so much more to do. There's it really highlights a need for future research. And I would say, interestingly, it's the decline of these national industries, these national industries that maybe we still don't have a good handle on. He talked about this. He studied a lot, the, the shake code period, but, but we don't really understand why firms don't react to the in incentive for continuing innovation. There's sort of two different stories that run through this. Maybe it's because they become an inert, you know, this size becomes the enemy of doing new things. And yet the spin-off engine that is so important early in this industry, why does that stop functioning later on? So why, if one individual national champion slows down, why don't we then see this, this spin-off engine driving resurgence and, and rebirth of the industry? So so a lot to understand there. And then, and then about the size of the firm and the national market, he says he thinks it's really a lot of these, not all of them, but a lot of them are, well, no, they are all American industries. And he says the size of the natural market is really important. I wonder if that has changed at all with the increasing access to a global market. Or will this be what really helps carry the next generation of Chinese and Indian tech firms that both have very large and interesting demanding own, sort of own national markets? Will that be what drives them from this sort of fast follower catch up mode to global dominance as in the, the last generation of, of tech innovators? So it's going to be interesting to study and to watch as it emerges. A, a lot of things to wonder about, Charlie. Very true. Very true. I suppose we should uh, we should wrap up. We've uh, we've we've had an extensive discussion. So so I lead off with uh, with our I wonder segment that we wrap up things. Yeah, yeah. Let's remind our listeners what this even is, since uh, they might be wondering where we went after our sabbatical. <laughs> well, I'm not going to talk about that. But uh, <laughs> so the I wonder segment is just how we wrap things up, and it's where we we share our ideas about not not fully formed for research projects, but just like you, like with our hallway conversation, things we might be thinking about, you know, what, what research topics are occurring to you as you, as you look, through, uh, look through the news headlines or, or things we're talking about in the hallway. Mm-hmm. Well, and so should I go first, Charlie, then? Uh, this yeah, one? Why, don't yeah you actually, so, why don't you actually? So, you know, and that. by the way, it said, it said in the preface to the book that I think one of the underappreciated things about academia is, is your colleagues and the ability to have those hallway conversations. And I know Stephen Klepper's colleagues just, they benefit immensely from having him in their lives. And I, I you know, I'm here at Duke with, with two of his former colleagues, Ashish Aurora and Wes Cohen, who say these kinds of things every day. And so I think- You can, I, feel, that, you can feel that love in this book. And obviously the, the fact that the book came out two years after his death is, a, is really a work of love love and tribute by his colleagues at Carnegie. Mm-hmm. And the I wonder exercise is, is fundamental to, to what we do. So for me, you know, it relates a little bit to what we talked about with clusters. Um, you know, when I look at the United States and perhaps around the world, but especially here in the U.S. where I know the best, you know, so much of our economic activity uh, and output is now sort of concentrated in um, clusters, in, in basically in urban areas and specifically. And that's been a big change in the U.S. So in the post-war era, there was a you know big move towards suburbanization. And so I know when my dad moved here from India, you know, suburbs were the thing. And now, you know, in this generation, people want to move to the downtown in many cases, young people raising kids uh, and families of all different kinds. And I think that's just a big shift. And as I've been thinking about it, I think it relates to a lot of different trends we're seeing in politics and economics, Um, everything over debates over gentrification to where we put transportation infrastructure. As you see more highly educated people in particular moving to the downtown core, it's changing a lot of things about American cities and, and everything and everywhere else. And there's a set of urban economists really at the vanguard, I think, of, of trying to unpack these trends, what's driving it and what it means. And I would love to see some of this come into strategy research somehow. Um, I think the urban economists, and we might talk about this in a future podcast, they're leveraging these great data sources on sort of microgeography and understanding where everything is. And I'd like to understand, you know, what role the firms play in in all this and also what kind of firms you know is it is it sort of service firms or is there a production element you know obviously mm-hmm. there's this notion of firms locating close to downtown so they can hire uh, tech employees who want to be able to walk to the craft brewery 
and live in a loft apartment. Uh, obviously, that's happening beyond just the major cities and second and third tier cities in the U.S. too. So I'd love to see a mix between what's going on in urban economics and some of the things we know about strategy uh, and location. And so that would be the thing I'd be wondering about um, over the next couple of weeks. That sounds fascinating. It sounds like a great topic for, uh, for another podcast as well. I hope we mm-hmm. do it. Okay, so what have I been wondering about? Well, I'll, you know, just briefly, I think it, it's stepping off from this uh, discussion of high-tech firms, you know, one of the things we're really hoping for from high-tech firms is really the next generation of great jobs in, in whatever economy you're looking at. But there has been some discussion and I think anxiety about this l- current generation of tech firms. They've created extraordinary stock market value, some of them, but some of them with very small numbers of employees. And so there's the sort of famous cases of, say, Instagram being bought for over a billion dollars with only, you know, tens of employees. So the, the value for per employee was enormous. And so I, I actually would love to see a descriptive study, and maybe it's been done because it's, it's, uh, the data is quite out there, but of just how much labor is, is going into the next generation of su- successful startups. The, um, you could look at trends in number of employees at time of IPO. You could look at how much value in either market or acquisition per employee was being created at the time of exit of founders. And uh, I just, there, there's these sort of uh, high profile cases of very small numbers of employees extraordinary uh, extraordinary market value i'd love to see first a descriptive study that looked at is that really a pattern over all our firms and then something that really plunged into mechanisms if it is there what are the sorts of things that are that are slowing down that are leading to this what what industry segments is it greater and what time periods what types of firms and types of exits is it is associated with so that's something i've been wondering about. charlie it's a first order concern for us to all wonder about and even the cases where the tech companies create jobs they're not often um you know the eight hundred thousand jobs uh in manufacturing aren't located uh with the company headquarters they might be in another country so you think about foxconn and the manufacturing for apple right and so even yes. though there are yes. there jobs associated with Apple, and quite a lot, they're not always, uh, let's say, in, in the focal country. And that causes a lot of political issues as well. So something that we should it all sure be thinking does. about and working it on. It sure does. Well, we've been seeing the fallout of just those sorts of issues uh, here in Europe uh, at the moment. So that brings us to uh, the end of our sixth edition of Research Chatter. Charlie, uh, send us home. If you liked it and you want to hear more, subscribe in iTunes and please spread the word. Our online home is at Strategic Management Society. Dot wordpress.com. There you can find links to all the papers we discuss, plus our contact info and Twitter accounts. And let us know what you think. We love your feedback in comments on Twitter at the Society's Facebook page. Let us know if you have new topics or papers for us to cover. We just love to hear from you on any of those uh, sites. For now, thanks for listening and see you next time.